It was 4.30 on the 21st of October, 1805. And just off the coast of Spain, Britain's greatest naval commander, Admiral Horatio Nelson, lay dying. Three hours earlier, as the Royal Navy was battling a combined French and Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar, he'd been struck by a sniper's musket ball. And now, as he lay close to the end, news was brought down to him that his fleet had achieved one of the Royal Navy's most famous victories that would dash Napoleon's invasion plan for Britain. Nelson weakly gasped, Thank God I've done my duty. It was an almost mythical end to Britain's greatest naval commander. But apart from the Battle of Trafalgar and Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square, what do people really know about this giant in British history who only stood at five foot four? This supreme naval commander, who actually suffered from seasickness throughout his career and still pulled off three of her greatest naval victories. This is the story of the life, career and death of Admiral Horatio Nelson. Horatio Nelson was born in 1758 at Burnham Thorpe in the county of Norfolk, England, the son of Reverend Edmund and Catherine Nelson. When Horatio was 12 years old, he joined the Royal Navy. And his passage into the Navy was smoothed by his maternal uncle, Captain Morris Suckling. Indeed, young Horatio joined his uncle on his ship, first as an ordinary seaman, before becoming a midshipman, the lowest officer rank. It was now that Nelson discovered that he didn't actually have any sea legs, suffering his first bout of seasickness. And incredibly, for a man who became Britain's greatest naval commander, he would continue to suffer from this motion sickness for the rest of his illustrious career. And it wasn't only seasickness from which he would suffer. He'd also be laid low with both malaria and yellow fever. These tropical diseases put many British sailors, soldiers, explorers and administrators into early graves. But Nelson was to overcome those too. He was also to lose an eye and an arm in the line of duty. And yet, for a man whose courage almost verged on a death wish, and who personally led boarding parties onto enemy ships, Horatio Nelson was only five foot, four inches tall. To gain more experience of the sea, Nelson's uncle transferred him to a merchant ship called the Mary Ann. He crossed the Atlantic twice to the West Indies with the Mary Ann, before hearing about an expedition to the Arctic. In 1773, Captain Constantine Phipps was tasked with leading an exploration to try and discover the fabled Northeast Passage, which many hoped would be an alternative route to the Far East and India. Now aged 14, Nelson jumped at the opportunity to join this adventure. Once more, his uncle, Captain Suckling, pulled a few strings and Phipps accepted young Horatio into his command as a midshipman. Phipps's expedition consisted of two ships, his own command, HMS Racehorse, and HMS Carcass, and it was the latter ship to which Nelson was appointed, serving as coxswain to its commander, a man by the brilliant 18th century name Skeffington Lutwidge. Almost sounds like a character out of Harry Potter. The expedition departed from Deptford on the River Thames on the 4th of June, 1773. It sailed up the coastline of Norway, passing Spitsbergen, and reached 10 degrees latitude from the North Pole. However, they found their way blocked by ice and were forced to return to England, arriving back in the September. It was during this expedition that Nelson was reported to have chased and then attacked a polar bear. When his captain, Lutwidge, asked why he'd undertaken such a brave and foolhardy action, the young Nelson merely replied that he wanted to present his father with the fur. It was a foretaste of his later courage. Unfortunately, the only fly in the ointment to this great story is that it only made an appearance after Skeffington Lutwidge told it in 1800. And by then, Nelson was already a naval hero. So we're left to wonder if Lutwidge told the story to prove that Nelson's courage went back a long way, or whether he was adding some artistic license to a tall tale. Whichever way you look at it, what we do know is that by the age of 15, Nelson had crossed the Atlantic twice and sailed deep into the Arctic Circle. What we also know is that Nelson certainly showed courage and a contempt for danger for the large part of his naval career. Three injuries and his death in battle prove that. Back in London, Uncle Morris Suckling once more pulled some strings to get Horatio his next appointment. It was a case of from the sublime to the ridiculous, as Nelson moved from the icy wastes of the Arctic to the tropical heat of India, where he joined the Royal Navy fleet at the British-controlled port of Madras. Within two years, the Anglo-Maratha War had broken out, and Nelson fought his first action. In 1775, he was escorting a convoy up the west coast of India bound for Bombay, 
when it was attacked by the fleet of the Sultan of Mysore. The Royal Navy put the attackers to flight. But before Nelson could celebrate too much, he was struck down with malaria and forced to return to Britain. He was by now just turning 17. Crossing the Atlantic, Arctic Circle, possibly fighting a polar bear, definitely fighting the Sultan of Mysore's fleet, and a bout of malaria by the time he was 17. <laughs> I hadn't even passed my driving test at that age. Back in Britain and two years later, he sat and passed his lieutenant's exam and was once more bound for the West Indies, this time on board HMS Lowestoft. Now, if you know your history dates, you will appreciate that the American colonies were in full rebellion against the British crown by now, and so Nelson was involved in patrolling the Caribbean, seeking out American privateers as well as commercial vessels. It was here that Nelson got his first taste of commanding a ship when he was ordered to captain a captured American merchantman called the Little Lucy. All right, it was a merchant prize rather than a Royal Navy ship of the line, but it was a start. And things improved in 1779 when he was placed in command of his very first naval vessel, a 12-gun brig, HMS Badger. This proved short-lived, as in June of that year he was promoted to post-captain. It is a rank that no longer exists. Back in those days, it identified men with the rank of captain from those lower ranks who were technically captaining ships, like a lieutenant, for instance. So, Horatio Nelson was a fully-fledged Royal Navy captain at the age of 20. Just before his 21st birthday, he was given command of the 28-gun HMS Hingenbrook. And as an aside, he handed over command of the Badger to another young officer whose career would dovetail with Nelson's at the Battle of Trafalgar, Cuthbert Collingwood. Now in command of the Hinchinbrook, he accompanied a British expedition to the Spanish-controlled Nicaragua. Why? Well, in a nutshell, because Spain and France were now openly siding with the American revolutionaries and had declared war on Britain. The attack on Nicaragua was part of a strategy to hit the Spanish where it hurt, in her rich American empire. The expedition was, however, a dismal failure for the British. They lost over 2,500 men, dead or wounded, principally to yellow fever. In fact, the only high point was the capture, after a two-week siege, of a mighty Spanish fort by Captain Nelson. The expedition retreated to Jamaica, and en route, Nelson himself contracted yellow fever. He was cared for by a Jamaican nurse come traditional healer, Cubba Cornwallis. If that surname rings a bell, yes, she did have a sort of relationship with General Cornwallis, who surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown. She was a former slave and housekeeper to Cornwallis's brother. In fact, rumour had it that she was a lot closer to Brother Cornwallis than simply a housekeeper. One of Cuba's contemporaries on the traditional healing circuit in Jamaica at the time was Mrs Grant, the mother of Mary Seacole of Crimean War fame. Anyway, thanks to Cabo Cornwallis's skills, Nelson recovered and by the following year was placed in command of a 28-gun frigate, HMS Albemarle. Once more, he sailed across the Atlantic for North America, and there, just off Boston, he narrowly escaped capture by a French ship. How history might have been different. Transferring to the command of Admiral Lord Hood, Nelson sailed for the Caribbean once more, where he met with one of the very few military failures he ever personally suffered in his long career. In 1783, he led a failed attack to recapture the Turks Islands from the French. Despite the failure, Hood held Nelson in high regard, so much so that when peace was finally declared, he charged Captain Nelson with taking the future King William IV, son of King George III, on HMS Albemarle on a visit to Havana in Cuba. It was while serving in the West Indies that he met and married Frances Fanny Nisbet. Fanny was a 25-year-old widow from a plantation-owning family on the island of Nevis. They returned to England in 1787 and set up home in his native county of Norfolk. But a tranquil family life was not to last long, as the clouds of war once more loomed. In 1789, the French Revolution broke out, and the French ended up in a prolonged conflict against an alliance of European powers, including Britain. Once more, the Royal Navy were called upon, and once more, Horatio Nelson was there. In 1793, he was placed in command of HMS Agamemnon, during the Siege of Toulon. Here, the British unsuccessfully tried to assist French counter-revolutionary forces. With the failure to hold Toulon, the British now turned their attention to the nearby island of Corsica, birthplace of an up-and-coming French military commander, 
Napoleon Bonaparte. It was during the Siege of Calvi on that island, where Nelson was supervising the British batteries, that he was hit in the eye by a shower of gravel from a returning shell. His right eye was to all intents and purposes blinded. Whilst Nelson claimed he could distinguish dark from light, he could no longer identify objects with that eye. And it was this eye to which he would place his telescope at the Battle of Copenhagen. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So far, a stellar career, but it was events in 1797 that would propel him into stardom. Before I go on, if you enjoy my work, then why not sign up for my free weekly newsletter? There's a link appearing now and also in the description. Anyway, back to 1797. By now, Spain had also joined France in her war with Great Britain. In February 1797, Nelson commanded the 74-gun HMS Captain at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, where the Royal Navy defeated a Spanish fleet. This was not Nelson's battle. Admiral Sir John Jervis was in command, but Nelson played a key role in the Royal Navy's victory that day. He was towards the back of the British line sailing into battle, and always desperate for both action and glory, his impatience snapped and he turned out of line and sailed directly towards the Spanish fleet. Supported by HMS Culloden, Nelson engaged three Spanish ships simultaneously, including the mighty 130-gun Santissima Trinidad. He personally led boarding parties that captured first the 80-gun San Nicolas and then the San Jose. Even by those days, it was extremely unusual for a flag officer to personally lead such attacks. The San Nicolas and the San Jose were two of the four Spanish ships captured by Jervis in his victory that day. And suddenly, Nelson became a national hero. He was appointed a Knight of the Order of the Bath, so he was now a Sir Horatio Nelson. He was also promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral, although this wasn't actually anything to do with the battle, but was due to him being next in line for promotion. Nevertheless, aged 29, he was now Rear Admiral Sir Horatio Nelson, national hero. It wasn't long before he was in action again. In fact, merely a matter of months. Nelson was ordered to blockade the main Spanish naval base at Cadiz. And during this blockade, Nelson in his longboat came face to face with the Spanish commander in his longboat. The ensuing fight between the two longboats not only displayed his own devil-may-care attitude towards danger, but also showed the loyalty of his men. One of his crew by the name of Sykes defended his admiral despite being wounded twice in the process. It was the sort of loyalty that Nelson inspired in his men, and it was why his arrival just before Trafalgar electrified the Royal Navy fleet. Still in 1797, and he was in action leading from the front again. This time it was his last military reversal, an attack on Santa Cruz de Tenerife in the Spanish-owned Canary Islands. During the attack, Nelson was once more wounded, which resulted in his right arm being amputated. Incredibly, he was back issuing orders within half an hour of the amputation. Despite his personal bravery, the attack was a major failure, costing his force 250 dead, 128 wounded, and over 300 British sailors captured. Despite that setback, he once more returned to a hero's welcome in Britain. At a time when Britain needed one, here was a dashing, aggressive young hero. He finished the year by being awarded a pension of £1,000, which is about £100,000 in today's money. The following year, 1798, he achieved arguably his most emphatic victory when he destroyed the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile. Now, I've told that story in a previous episode, so I won't go into the details now, but I will post a link at the end and in the description so you can watch it in a while. The Battle of the Nile showed Nelson at his very best. That incredible blend of personal courage, tactical genius, and his willingness to give his captains, his band of brothers as he called them, the authority to use their own initiative. It was Captain Thomas Foley who, spotting a narrow gap in the French defences, sailed through to attack the French from their landward and unprepared side. The end result was Nelson capturing or sinking 11 of the 13 French ships of the line, for no losses of his own. Following his victory, Nelson sailed to Naples, then an ally against France, where he renewed his acquaintance with the wife of the British ambassador, Lady Emma Hamilton. Their relationship had been simmering for several months, but now it came out in the open, brazenly for all to see. He might have been a national hero, but the married Nelson's scandalous behaviour was causing waves back at home. It's one of the reasons suggested as to why, despite his emphatic victory at the Nile, he was only raised to the noble rank of a baron 
rather than the more senior Viscount. And that snub rankled with Nelson. For all his courage and strategic genius, Nelson did have an Achilles heel. Well, apart from being unfaithful to his wife and having an open affair with another man's wife. His vanity. He loved to adorn his uniform with every order he'd been given by both the British and any other government. As General Sir John Moore, who was to be killed at the Battle of Corunia, remarked, he looks more like a prince of the opera than the conqueror of the Nile. Possibly his most ostentatious decoration was a chelenk, or plume of diamonds, presented to him by the Ottoman Sultan, in gratitude for helping restore their fortunes in Egypt following the Battle of the Nile. The diamond-encrusted plumes connected to a large central diamond, which in itself was mounted on a clockwork motor so that it turned to catch the sun. Nelson insisted on wearing this ornament on his naval hat. In an age where most other British military commanders played down their successes, Nelson stood out from the crowd, and he loved the attention. In his sartorial dress sense was manner from heaven for cartoonists such as the leading caricaturist of the day, James Gilray. His ego was given another boost the following year, when, having controversially helped quell a Republican rebellion in Naples, he was rewarded by their king with the title Duke of Bronte. He might only be a British baron, but he was now an Italian duke. Despite it being a foreign title, Nelson would thereafter sign himself Nelson and Bronte. We were discussing in my monthly live chat on my membership channel last night how all heroes have Achilles heels. It just seems that we live in an age where everyone prefers to point out the flaws rather than the achievements. Not so back in history, where Achilles heels were often forgiven. In 1801, Nelson was second in command at the Battle of Copenhagen. And once again, I've covered this in a separate episode, so check it out afterwards to get all the details. Suffice to say that Nelson once more combined tactical genius, personal charisma and daredevil courage to deliver an overwhelming victory for the Royal Navy. At the height of the battle, the commander, Admiral Hyde Parker, signalled to Nelson to disengage. This was the moment that he lifted his telescope to his blind eye and announced that he really couldn't see the signal. The victory and his telescope stunt sent his reputation soaring even higher back in Britain. In recognition, he was finally raised to the rank of Viscount, Viscount Nelson of the Nile and Burnhamthorpe in the county of Norfolk. It was in this year that Nelson abandoned his wife Fanny to live with Emma Hamilton in a house he'd purchased in Merton in Surrey, now southwest London. To all intents and purposes, they lived as husband and wife despite the fact that both his wife and Emma's legal husband was still alive. He'd actually die in 1803. Before then, she'd borne Nelson a daughter, whom they named Horatia. In 1803, Nelson was promoted to the rank of Vice Admiral and placed in command of the Mediterranean fleet, to where he sailed on his flagship, HMS Victory. For the next two years, he kept the French fleet under Admiral Villeneuve bottled up in Toulon. However, in January 1805, the French Admiral finally managed to slip out. His mission was to draw the Royal Navy, and Nelson in particular, away from the English Channel to enable Napoleon to launch an invasion of Britain. And it wasn't a mere pipe dream. The French Emperor had assembled a huge army, along with landing barges, at Boulogne, facing England across the Channel. Sailing through the Strait of Gibraltar, Villeneuve entered the Atlantic and headed for the West Indies. At that time, the Sugar Islands of the Caribbean were a major source of tax wealth for the British government. Any blockage of that trade route or capture of the sugar-producing islands would impact on Britain's finances, and thus her ability to wage war. And consequently, Nelson was ordered to pursue Villeneuve. Having crossed the Atlantic, the French learned that Nelson was close behind. Such was Nelson's reputation for skill and aggression that Villeneuve, who had survived the Battle of the Nile, decided that he'd rather return home than fight it out. Nelson also turned around and set off in pursuit. Villeneuve's intention was to rendezvous with Napoleon and potentially escort his invasion force across the Channel. However, he was checked by another British fleet off Cape Finisterre. Unable or unwilling to sail up the Channel, and with Nelson now closing in behind him, Villeneuve made for the safety of his Spanish allies' naval port at Cadiz. And there he waited, unsure what to do next, not least because he was unsure where Nelson was. Nelson was actually back in London, reporting to the Secretary of War, Lord Castlereagh. It was there, whilst waiting in Castlereagh's reception room, that on the 24th of September, 
he met Arthur Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington. It was the only time these two British military giants met. Initially, Nelson didn't realise who Wellesley was, and the Iron Duke later recalled that the talk was dominated by the Admiral, talking all about himself. It was only when he'd left the room that Nelson found out that Wellesley had just arrived back from winning a series of victories in India. He re-entered the room, and it was as if a light switch had been flicked. Suddenly, he took an interest in Wellesley, asking about his campaigns and talking strategy as equals. Later, Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, recalled that he couldn't remember a conversation that had interested him more. In that brief encounter, Arthur Wellesley had seen the two sides of Horatio Nelson, his vanity and his charisma. A few days later, Nelson once more boarded HMS Victory and secretly headed south to join his fleet close to Cadiz. His arrival electrified the fleet, ordinary sailors and officers alike. He was there to lead them into battle, and Horatio Nelson was, above all else, a winner. On the 20th of October, Villeneuve, oblivious to Nelson's presence, finally left the safety of the port with a combined French and Spanish fleet. The following day, 21st October, 1805, Nelson pounced near Cape Trafalgar. I have told the story about the Battle of Trafalgar in another episode, which I do recommend to you. The video on YouTube has had over 100,000 views. At 1.15pm, during the height of the battle, Nelson was walking on the main deck of HMS Victory, resplendent in his uniform, with all those honours attached, when he was shot by a marksman from a French ship. The musket ball entered his left shoulder, passing through his lung and lodged in his spine. Mortally wounded, he was taken below deck to the surgeons. There was nothing that could be done to save him. In the gloom, Nelson lay dying, with the sounds of the battle echoing in his ears. At 4.30pm, he was told that the battle had been a complete victory for the Royal Navy. 22 of the 33 enemy ships of the line had been either captured or sunk for the loss of not a single British vessel. Secure in the knowledge that he'd once more been victorious, Nelson uttered his immortal last words. Thank God I have done my duty. He was 47 years old. News of the victory at the Battle of Trafalgar was greeted with a huge surge of pride and emotion back in Britain. This quickly was dampened when the news of Nelson's death arrived. King George III summed up what many felt, that with Nelson's death, the country had lost more than they'd gained. Nelson's body was brought back to England for a hero's funeral. Initially preserved in a barrel of brandy on HMS Victory, Britain's greatest naval commander was then placed in a lead-lined coffin. The wood of that coffin came from the main mast of the Lorient, the French flagship at the Battle of the Nile. He lay in state for three days in the painted hall at Greenwich Hospital before processing up the Thames on King Charles II's state barge. On the 9th of January 1806, Admiral Viscount Horatio Nelson received a state funeral at St Paul's Cathedral. It was attended by 32 admirals along with the Prince of Wales. 10,000 soldiers lined the route. In fact, the procession was so long that the advance party formed by the Scots Greys had arrived at St Paul's before the rear of the procession had even set out from the Admiralty. And there in St Paul's Cathedral, Nelson was laid to rest in a sarcophagus, originally intended for Henry VIII's right-hand man, Cardinal Wolsey. You can visit it in St Paul's Cathedral to this day. The love of his life, Emma Hamilton, was refused permission to attend the funeral. After all, Nelson still had an official wife, Fanny. Fanny would die in 1831 and is buried alongside her son from her first marriage in the churchyard at Littleham near Exmouth in Devon. She would outlived Emma, who died in Calais in 1815. Emma and Nelson's daughter, Horatia, went on to marry a clergyman and had a brood of children. Three of her sons served in the military, including one as a surgeon in the Royal Navy. She eventually died in Pinna, Middlesex, in 1881. Of course, Nelson's fame and legacy live on. In 1840, his statue was placed on top of a 170-foot column erected in Trafalgar Square. Nelson's column is one of London's iconic images. Back in 2002, a BBC public poll placed Nelson in ninth place as the greatest Briton of all time. A man of vanity, certainly, but also a man of personal courage who led from the front. A naval genius who knew how to take advantage in the chinks in his enemy's armour. A man who inspired loyalty from ordinary sailors and encouraged his captains to act on their own initiative. 
Above all, a man whose aggressive tactics won three incredible victories at the Nile, Copenhagen and Trafalgar. Those victories, especially Trafalgar, gave Great Britain the domination of the world's oceans for the next 100 years. And together with her pole position in the Industrial Revolution, that naval supremacy would help make the 19th century the British century. It was achieved in no small part, thanks to Admiral Horatio Nelson. British history is so rich and there is so much of it. In my membership channel I produce exclusive videos where I go into a lot more detail uncovering forgotten events and characters. For example, this week's members story is all about the airship R101, Britain's answer to the Hindenburg, which met a similar fiery fate in 1930. Click on the links appearing now and in the description to find out more. Thanks for your support, keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.